Hi everyone, we're here to talk to you about a subject that is overlooked and often underappreciated. The tiny but mighty warriors that help to pollinate and cultivate, the bee. The bumblebee is the first species of bee to be placed on the endangered species list and is the most at risk for ecological extinction, with colonies plummeting at 90% since the 1990s. If the bees go ecologically extinct, it does not necessarily mean the species is gone for good. It just means that they are no longer abundant enough to provide their ecological service. No bees, no flowers, no honey, no crops, no food. We are Madison, Alexis, Leslie, and Natalie, and this is the Buzz on Bees. Dun, dun, dun. Human society is extremely complex and fragile, built upon various pillars. One of them is the honeybee. One out of three meals eaten by humans is made possible by honeybees. They are so important that if all the honeybees were to die out, thousands of plants would follow, which could lead to millions of people starving in the following years. On top of that, honeybees have a huge economic impact. The dollar value of plants pollinated by them each year is around 265 billion. Food we take for granted would just stop existing without them, or there would be a massive decrease in productivity. Food including apples, onions, pumpkins, and also plants used for feeding livestock, and thus extremely important for our milk and meat. Einstein is often quoted as having said, if honeybees die out, humans will follow a few years later. Actually, he probably didn't say that, but there might be some truth in the statement. It's unsettling, but honeybees have started to disappear. Millions of hives have died in the last few years. Beekeepers all over the world have seen an annual loss of 30 to 90 percent of their colonies. In the U.S. alone, bees are steadily declining, from 5 million hives in 1988 to 2.5 million today. Since 2006, a phenomenon called colony collapse disorder has affected honeybees in many countries, and we're not entirely sure what's causing it. All we know is that it's pretty serious. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering what could cause these tiny little beings to decline at such a not-so-tiny rate. Some human factors include pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides, and they are among some of the most detrimental causes of the bumblebee population decline. Not only do they contribute to their death, but more commonly, pesticides alter the way bees learn how to behave, navigate, and feed. Bees learn through spatial orientation and navigation recognition. They make it a point to remember where certain plants are, where their hive is in relation to those plants, etc. Basically like a built-in maps app for their tiny little brains. Pesticides can cause a delay or regression in these essential characteristics, which in turn makes it relatively impossible for the bees to do their jobs. As mentioned in the video, colony collapse disorder is one of the reasons for the decreasing number in our bee populations, although it is not entirely to blame. There are other factors that play into the decline of bees, most anthropogenic, which we will touch upon shortly. In essence, colony collapse disorder, or CCD, is when the majority of worker bees in a colony disappear, leaving behind the queen, immature bees also called broads, and food as well as nurse bees to watch over the queen and the broads. There are several reasons for why the worker bees are disappearing. It could be due to invasive pests, pesticide poisoning, changes to the habitat, or poor nutrition. However, they disappear, and the hives cannot sustain themselves without the worker bees. So no worker bees leads to a complete colony collapsing. It's important to note that CCD is not the same as acute pesticide poisoning. With CCD, there are very few, if any, dead bees near the hive at all. If there is a pile of dead bees near the hive, you've got a case of acute pesticide poisoning caused by inaccurate and careless use of pesticide. Certain pesticides attack the insect's nervous system, resulting in their death, while others simply weaken the bees and interfere in their daily abilities. Neonicotinoid is a commonly used pesticide in both the U.S. and other countries. It's used on about 95% of corn, canola crops, the majority of cotton, sugar, beets, half of soybeans, apples, cherries, peaches, oranges, berries, leafy greens, tomatoes, potatoes, grains, rice, nuts, and wine grapes. Neonicotinoids were welcomed as a safer alternative to its predecessor, DDT. However, its impact on insects, and particularly bees, is extremely problematic. Neonicotinoids attack insects by harming their nervous system and also interfere with the bees' ability to navigate back to their hives.
Because the pesticide grows with the plant, which is beneficial for humans because it lessens the exposure and doesn't call for reapplication, it poses the question of how bees are expected to pollinate and provide their services if their food supply is all contaminated with harmful chemicals. Landscape structure influences the temporal and spatial availability of food, nesting, and mating sites. Human impacts such as fragmentation, degradation, destruction, and alteration of natural habitats to create better living conditions for mankind are to blame for the declining population of the bee species, both wild and hybrid or grown bees. Bee abundance and species richness relies heavily on the quality and quantity of the plant species found in an area of land. Human alteration of the land and the removal of wildflower fields to be replaced by monoculturist farming grounds takes away the habitat and food supply of many pollinators. Displacing bees causes them to migrate and find home elsewhere, most times in places with different enemies and predators adding on to their vulnerability. Changing the land also changes the amount of light, water, and nutrients plants will receive, which also impacts what and how bees pollinate. If bees are no longer attracted to the plants available, the pollen transfer and their reproductive success will be affected. Another thing that is at fault for the decline of the bee population is none other than climate change. The bees will have to adapt to a whole new array of predators, parasites, pathogens, and stresses. Bees already have numerous predators and parasites preying among them. They're also already affected by 18 different viruses, and climate change will heighten the extremity of existing viruses, but will also create new viruses. Bees are very particular with the temperature in which they live in. If it's too cold, they stay in their hive, and if it's too hot, they go to their nearest body of water to try and cool down. However, with climate change comes extreme weather events, meaning that places that experience cold winters and hot summers can expect to experience longer and more extreme winters and summers as well. Droughts and our access to water always seem to be a key issue when mentioning climate change. If mankind decides to allocate all water for our use, will there even be enough bees for bees to cool down five summers from now? Could they take a dip in the water from crops? However, that water is contaminated with pesticides and other toxins, which can result in killing bees either way. Lastly, varroa mites are the sneaky little creatures that manage to make their way into hives by catching a ride on the caboose of bees. They are contributors to a massive amount of bee loss over the last decade, and they prey on broad larvae as their initial source of attack. Once they have breeded within the nesting grounds, they then move on to infest the colony at large, transmitting various diseases, bacteria, and viruses that are responsible for the loss of several bee populations within the United States alone. It is hard to control the spread of these mites, especially within hives, as once the bees head out on their next endeavor, they will only seem to bring back more hitchhikers. Since varroa mites don't have any wings of their own, they slip into hives by hitching a ride on the backs of adult bees. And for the lucky mite, the trip includes an in-flight meal, as varroa mites will begin feeding on bee blood within a few minutes of clinging to the bee. Once they've entered the hive, varroa mites slip undetected into the vulnerable, uncapped brood cells. This is where the mites lay in wait until the bees cap the brood. Once a cell is capped, the mother mite, like a tiny vampire, climbs atop the cocoon of the developing bee, tears open a hole, and begins to feed on its blood. Within three days, the mother mite lays her first egg, which always develops into a male. Then, she lays one female egg every 30 hours over the next week or so in her newly acquired home under the brood cap. And as each of these female mites mature, they mate with their brother. By the time the baby bee develops and leaves its infested cell, as many as three fertilized mites will emerge with it, and the cycle continues. Pollination is recognized as one of 17 ecosystem services. By bees being bees and taking pollen from different flowers, they provide various provisioning and regulating services. A direct value of pollination is increased production of market-based crops, fiber, forage, timber, and non-timber forest products. Bees and their pollination are also extremely important for food production, food diversity, food security, and price stability. Human nutrition and our local economy rely heavily on animal pollinators. The service bees provide account for up to $300 billion annually and is responsible for 75% of the world's most important crops, with 35% of them depending directly on pollinators. 
Without the bees to pollinate said crops, we can kiss many of our favorite nuts, fruits, veggies, and grains goodbye, or risk paying an extremely high price for them. Bees are so important for the human diet, but they also help ensure plant biodiversity, which helps the environment on multiple scales. For one, pollination impacts primary productivity, which affects the vegetative cover that contributes to flood, erosion, climate control, water purification, nitrogen fixation, and carbon sequestration. They also ensure pollen is spread from one plant to another. So although the services they deliver are local, these mighty warriors are interconnected with the entire environment. So any changes done to the environment that we've mentioned all impact the bees' well-being and the quality of the services they provide. Now that we've discussed why the bee population is declining and its significance, here are some possible solutions. The first solution that we'll be discussing would be ecological farming. Organic farming enhances wildflowering plants within fields and field margins, supporting bee diversity and abundance. Organic management of grasslands for livestock enhances ground cover and diversity of plant life. Traditional organic hay meadows are an important habitat for bees, with the decline of bees in Europe linked to the loss of hay meadows. Secondly, natural and semi-natural habitats on farms within agricultural landscapes, such as wooded areas, hedge groves, and fields will allow the bee population to have a place to function. Bees need this habitat for overwintering, provision of nesting sites, and food from pollen and nectar in wildflowers. Lastly, farming without synthetic chemical pesticides and ecological pest control encourages natural enemies such as ladybirds, lacewings, certain beetles, spiders, and parasitides that prey on crop pests in order to ensure that synthetic pesticides are not harmful to the honeybee population. Seed mixes have also been developed that are tailored to enhance natural enemies and are grown alongside crops to encourage biodiversity. So what exactly have been the EPA's actions to help the declining bee population, you may ask? In June 2014, President Obama issued a memorandum establishing a pollinator health task force co-chaired by the USDA and the EPA to create a national pollinator health strategy that promotes the health of honeybees and other pollinators. Furthermore, the EPA implemented a policy in 2017 that protects bees from agricultural pesticide spray and dust application while the bees are pollinating. They also prohibited the use of certain neonicotine pesticides when bees are present. The EPA is currently working with pesticide manufacturers to develop new seed planting pesticide treated seed. Lastly, the EPA is providing farmers and beekeepers with EPA's reduced toxicity time data to gouge the length of time that specific pesticide products will be toxic to bees and other pollinators. Although the EPA is currently taking action to prevent the decline of the honeybee population, there are additional measures that can be taken that will help further ensure that the bee population is protected. The first political solution that can be taken would be to ban all pesticides that are harmful to bees and other pollinators, including chlorpyrifos, cypermethrin, and deltamethrin. Secondly, adopting bee action initiatives would entail more effective regulation and control over agricultural chemicals and facilitating the monitoring of the health of bees and other pollinators. Furthermore, working to improve the conservation of natural and semi-natural habitats around agricultural landscapes will help ensure biodiversity. Public and private land policies such as zoning laws, conservation and land trusts would affect the distribution of lands that are managed as natural, rural, urban, and industrial areas with density and space will be set aside for floral and nesting resources for the security of the bees' habitats. Thirdly, shifting towards ecological farming models through public and private funding may be used to focus on research and ecological farming practices. Fourthly, farm advisory committees would help encourage and ensure that farmers are successfully implementing these practices. Lastly, conservation secu security programs will reward farmers for a variety of sound practices that influence pollinator populations. This would include subsidies for farmers and tax deductions for implementing these policies. Now that we have discussed actions being taken by the government, and political solutions that can be taken to further ensure that the bee population is preserved, here are some ways that locally you can help in ensuring that the bee population is being protected. The first one would be planting flowers within your garden. 
plant flowers that bees are attracted to, such as bee balm, black-eyed Susan, and goldenrod. Stop using pesticides on your plants. Instead, buy ladybugs to deal with aphids and praying mantises to handle insect pests. Lastly, buy local honey. This will ensure that local beekeepers will continue to preserve bees and their habitats. We hope we made you more curious about the buzz with these bees and that you will consider taking some action, whether it be big or small. Bees have a huge monetary value and are essential players in biodiversity, the growth and nutrition of crops, and allowing human beings to thrive in general. Don't take these little guys for granted, or you're going to end up with no roses to stop and smell along the way through a dismal, hungry future. A direct value of pollination is increased product... Frick. The service bees provide account for up to $300... <laughs> $300? <laughs> That's it. So good. Get it together. <laughs> <laughs>